It's June 23rd, 1868, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. U.S. Patent Number 79,265, granted on this day in 1868, is a dry technical document involving self-adjusting platens, crossbeams, pulleys, clogs. But at its end, its authors explain in layman's terms the practical use of their product. Quote, the writing of ordinary communications with types instead of a pen. And thus, finally, the world had a workable, mass-producible typewriter. And there's as little romance in what they did with this machine as there was in the technical details of the patent. They wrote a contract for Christopher Latham Scholes, one of the inventors of the machine, uh, needed in his capacity as the comptroller for the city of Milwaukee. But the second thing that they did with the machine was actually quite useful. (laughs) They used the machine to write letters that they sent to all of their friends asking for money to invest in this fabulous new device. And as you mentioned, Scholes was the comptroller of the city of Milwaukee. But like most 19th century American entrepreneurs, he had like 17 other jobs. So he was a politician. He was an amateur inventor. uh, He was a newspaper publisher. His first idea was a device for quickly printing numbers in transactions like serial numbers for tickets, page numbers in books. And it was a friend of his and another amateur inventor. I feel like most men in America in the 1800s were amateur inventors. So this guy, Charles S. Glidden, he was the first to point out that this same principle could be extended to alphabetical characters to create a typing machine. Yeah, it seems really obvious, doesn't it, to take Gutenberg's movable type printing press, which was perhaps the defining invention of the 500 years (laughs) around this date, (laughs) and say, hmm, how can we do this so that more people can use it? But I suppose a bit like the personal computer, and it taking the vision of people like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates to realise that everyone might want one on their desk at home and making that affordable would be ultimately worthwhile. A lot of people were like, yes, we can see that if you apply ink to paper using pressure, that will have a use, perhaps to send memos around the office. But the concept of the lady of letters at home choosing to use a typewriter, a machine, rather than handwriting, which for centuries had been the way of expressing personality and intimacy was anathema to a lot of people. But actually, this first prototype wasn't very user-friendly, certainly from our perspective now. It kind of looked like a box that you would buy 12 cupcakes in. It was that kind of shape. And it had a horizontal frame on top rather than vertically because they didn't have the cylinder at that time. So you literally had to attach the piece of paper over a frame, which meant that the user could only use a very specific paper size. And also it had to be very thin because of the way that the types were striking the paper. But the main problem to a user was that the type bars struck from below rather than above which meant that the user couldn't see what they were typing. And front striking, what it's called, you know, the the way you picture a typewriter with the keys hitting the front of the paper, yeah. that, that wouldn't even become standard till the 1890s. I mean, the version of this typewriter that really hit big was when Remington, the manufacturer, got involved to make this thing. And that was some time after this. But nonetheless, it came back to this patent, which doesn't include the QWERTY keyboard, which ultimately is the biggest legacy of the Scholes typewriter, because we're still using it on iPads and stuff. And it also did include lowercase letters. It wasn't even the first patent for a typewriter. There'd been dozens of them in different countries, including a British guy like a hundred years before who came up with something similar. But it was just the one that was the most practicable. Mind you, after they sent out these letters to friends pleading for money, one of the people who responded was a guy called James Densmore. And he said, this looks good. And sight unseen agreed to buy a quarter of the patent. But when he finally saw it, he said, this is good for nothing, presumably because of all of those problems that you were mentioning, Rebecca. And his feedback was discouraging enough that Sewell and Glidden immediately left the project, leaving only Scholes and Densmore to pursue. Stewart, and they then went to Remington, who were like, actually, yes, there is something here. By the way, if you're thinking, is this the same Remington that makes my foot massager and my uh, <laughs> hair straightener and my shaver? Yes. I mean, it has its origins yeah. <laughs> in the same company. We'll, I'm sure, do another episode about Victor Kayam another day. But yes. E. Remington and Sons Wikipedia entry summarises them as a manufacturer of firearms and typewriters. <laughs> yeah, they, they were really riding the 19th century high. Yeah. Yes, they had done... Remington had done what Variety calls boffo box office during the American Civil War. But obviously, we're now looking to diversify into less bloodthirsty streams. <laughs> Honestly, so much credit has to go to James Densmore, the, this reluctant investor. Because when he saw the typewriter, he wasn't thrilled, but he'd already paid the money at this point. And now, with Saul and Glidden leaving, he and Scholes were sort of in a partnership. So while Scholes oversaw dozens of incrementally improved designs, 
Densmore really threw himself into trying to make, A, trying to make the production financially viable and B, drumming up investor interest. And he was the one who happened to send one of his promo notes to an executive at Remington. And they actually then, once Remington purchased the rights to make the design, they spent months refining it using their sewing machine department. That was one other thing they'd branched into already was sewing machines, which explains the distinctive look of those early typewriters. that have got that black lacquer casing, which I learnt in the course of researching this episode. It's called Japanning. Mm. Remington's first advertising campaign billed the typewriter as a machine, quote, the size of a sewing machine and an ornament to an office study or sitting room. It is certain to become indispensable in families as the sewing machine, said the manufacturer of sewing machines. Um, so you can see why <laughs> they tried to tie the two things together, but they're so different, aren't they? Mm. They made it look like a sewing machine. They put floral designs on it. And obviously, it was the lady of the household who both was the sewer and also more likely the letter writer in this era mm. if you're talking about domestic things, you know, writing to your sister saying, do you want to come for dinner on Friday or whatever. And so that's how they positioned their marketing, which makes sense, but was so influential, I think, in ways that even they didn't realise and ultimately sort of led to the typing pool. And the idea mm. of being a secretary, being something of a job for women. Yeah, so the problem that Remington immediately ran into was who's going to buy a typewriter? Businesses were initially quite reluctant. They didn't really see the advantages. They already had you know, whole departments of clerks writing in longhand and shorthand. So a lot of businesses didn't have the vision to see the potential. And also individuals, they didn't really, the average person didn't write enough to justify the asking price, which was about $125, which is an awful lot of money, especially if you're writing to friends and relations who don't really care about your handwriting. And also some of the early adopters, like Mark Twain was sort of, you you know what Stephen Fry was to Apple, Mark Twain was <laughs> yeah, to the typewriter. He was. <laughs> and, and he complained that every time he used it to write a letter, the responses he got from his friends would just be asking him questions about the typewriter and what it was like <laughs> to use the typewriter. Yeah, it reminds me of the guy who went penny farthing around the world, do you remember? And everyone was just asking yeah. about his bicycle all the time. <laughs> Like, you're an early, early adopter. You just have to talk about the technology whilst you're using it all the time. I've been shooting lions, guys. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of people, I found this so funny. It's so relatable to the modern day as well. But the, the fact that consumers were put off by the all uppercase typeface. Mm, yeah. So it wasn't until the Remington number two that they introduced the shift key. But that's an issue that gets in people's craw to this day. You know, people felt like they were being shouted at. So it was the Remington company that had this idea of promoting it aggressively to women. Yeah, and so it's for that reason that the typewriter is really credited as having assisted the entrance of women into the clerical workplace because many of them were hired to operate these new devices that were gradually spreading through offices around the world. Which in itself, by the way, was good viral marketing. Look, it's so easy even a woman can use it was part of them showing how you could demonstrably use it. Obviously, the reason it was acceptable for women to enter the office as typists... Until they were married until they were married for that very short period of time was because it was copying and it was dictation. They weren't writing their own words. Mm. They were copying the words of the male employees. So it was seen as something that was respectable and suitable for girls. They weren't pushing too hard into the men's workplace. Finally, a job that a machine can do. Let's give it to the ladies. <laughs> and it had a massive effect. So in 1874, less than 4% of US clerical workers were women. But by 1900, it was 75%. Wow. And actually, Scholes was really pl proud about this. He said, just before his death in 1890 I do feel that I have done something for the women this will enable them more easily to earn a living I think he was probably right I mean he had some really good attitudes he was an early free soiler in his career as a politician before he became an inventor and free soilers were a political movement who opposed the expansion of slavery <laughs> then he went into cahoots with a gun manufacturer can we just remember <laughs> <laughs> there is that uh, but I suppose he was guiding them away from creating guns so I that's guess. useful but he was also instrumental in the the successful movement to abolish capital punishment in, in Wisconsin. And by 1915, it was such a well-established idea that the typewriter had transformed business. There was a great exhibition in San Francisco that year, the one that launched the Panama Canal, in fact. And mm. in their marketing to sponsor the event, Remington explained that just like the building of the canal, they were powering American business and speeding up the world of finance. And the thing that really made it take off was the QWERTY keyboard. And the problem that was being experienced was that the keys kept jamming against one another because of their slow recovery after a, a keystroke. And so Densmore had this thought, well, why don't we find a way to position the keys so that they won't hit each other? So the QWERTY arrangement was come up with through letter analysis, trying to work out which letters didn't sit next to each other in words very often, therefore minimising the risk that the two keys would be hitting one another as you use them. So that's how they came up with the QWERTY piece. But also, supposedly, the original 
original design had a full stop instead of the R, and Remington swapped that for the R key, supposedly so their salesman could type typewriter using only the top row of the keyboard. That is such a yeah. great fact. That is the one I to take that. with you to the pub this evening, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow. And so the overall winner caused a bit of a stir. You might say it ruffled some feathers. Hey! Love the show? Support the show. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.